everybody. My name is Lucy Key Myers, and I'm a staff scientist at the Weber Institute of Brain Development. And today I'm going to be presenting on the single cell and spatial transcriptomics in the postmortem brain. We'll start with some background on the human DLPFC. A remarkable aspect of the human brain is its highly organized structure and function relationships, including, especially in the cerebral cortex. The cortex plays a key role in many functions, such as perception, awareness, thought, mem memory, language, and movement. The dorsolateral free prefrontal cortex, or the DLPFC, is especially important in executive functions, including working memory, cognitive flexibility, and planning. Disruptions of this brain region may may be associated with several psychiatric and neurodevelopment disorders, including schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. A defining architectural feature of the DLPFC is the, six, is the subdivision into six cortical layers, each containing a unique distribution of different cell types and connections to other cortical or subcortical brain regions. In the cortex, especially the position of a cell within its spatial layer influences gene expression, morphology, physiology, and function. In fact, studies of the postmortem brains of individuals with schizophrenia and autism may have implicated not only specific cell types in these conditions, but also revealed differences in neuronal and synaptic structure that are spatially localized in specific cortical layers. One of the ways that we can understand the function of different cell types and structures in the brain is to study what genes they express. In the past years, there have been several rapidly evolving transcriptomic approaches for studying gene expressions in the brain using RNA sequencing. This LEGO brain schematic illustrates how we've expanded from bulk RNA, seq bulk RNA sequencing, which contains a mixture of cell types, um, and it's kind of like this pile of LEGO where we can't really tell the differences, different part, to a uh, single nucleus or single cell RNA-seq, which allows us to understand the transcriptional profile of one single cell nucleus or populations of different cell types or different cell or, um, and then most recently is spatial transcriptomics, which aims to link gene expression to its anatomical location and to add other molecular insights into the structure function relationships. Some background on single cell nucleus RNA-seq. Um, this tech is achieved by using uniquely barcoded gel beads um, that are paired with one, hopefully one single nucleus or cell. Um, this links uh, this links the RNA uh, molecules in that nucleus to that unique barcode, and when they're sequenced, we can relate them back to one single nucleus. Um, from there, we're able to um, transcriptionally profile those individual cells and group them into cell type populations. Um, here on the right, we have a dimensionality reduction plot, which is often how this data is displayed. Um, so all the gene expression across thousands of genes is reduced to just two dimensions. And then we're able to um, cluster and annotate cell types based on the, that gene expression. So that is what is displayed here. Um, and then to note that when we are studying human brain, we're often limited to uh, frozen tissue. Um, and as freezing destroys the cell membrane, we are limited to just using the nucleus as the, uh, the cells are not maintained. Um, and then the other tech that we'll all be discussing today is spatial transcriptomics, sometimes also called uh, Visium from 10, uh, we use Visium from 10X. Um, so how this tech works is similar, it relies on uniquely barcoded um, spots or unique barcodes, but this time in spots that are arranged in an array on a slide. Um, and then like a piece, a thin piece of tissue is placed on that slide and the um, RNA in the that space is then linked to the RNA, to the spot on the fiducia, on the frame. Um, so that way we're able to uh, link um, mo molecules of RNA back to a uh, 2D space, back to the 2D space that the tissue. Um, and, and so here we have a, an example of a representative piece of human DLPFC. Um, so here we have like white matter and then the six cortical layers that we discussed. Um, so uh, here we can show the expression of SNAP25, which is a marker gene, which is a gene that's expressed in neurons. And we can see that that lights up the gray matter sections, whereas our white matter is dark. And then um, conversely, we have MBP, which is a marker for glial cells that exist in the white matter. And we can see that that lights up the white matter. And then finally, we have PCP4, which is a marker for histological layer five, 
Um, and we can see like that nice arc and defines that histological layer. So we're able to explore the expression of different genes in that 2D space in the tissue. So the work that I'm going to be discussing today um, is uh, a paired single nucleus RNA-seq and visium uh, and spatial gene expression using Visium tech um, in the human DLPFC. Um, so we um, performed the study on neurotypical adults, um, and we also selected for high quality RNA. Um, degradation is like a big issue with uh, human brain tissue as um, sometimes sample collection is not always in ideal scenarios. Um, so we had to select for high quality RNA. Um, we have 30 Visium samples from 10 different donors um, over three positions over the anterior, middle, and posterior axis of the DLPFC. And we have 19 single nucleus RNA-seq samples from 10 donors over almost two positions for each donor. Um, so to so the outline of the rest of the talk, first I will talk about identifying data-driven spatial domains in the Visium data. Um, then I'll move on to talking about uh, cell type population identification in our single nucleus RNA-seq data. And third, bring those two data sets together um, and talk about the applications of paired spatial and single nucleus RNA-seq data to study cell type compositions and cell to cell interactions. Um, so some previous work done at Lieber on the DLPFC was um, also a smaller scale um, spatial transcriptomic with Visium study um, where uh, we use Visium to explore spatial gene expression in the DLPFC in cell samples. Um, here, we actually manually annotated the, the six histological layers in the white matter in the tissue, as you can see here. Um, and we also explored uh, layer-enriched gene expression across those different layers. Um, also in this experiment, we did some um, preliminary exploration of data-driven clustering and different methods. Um, so why might we want to use uh, unsupervised or data-driven clustering? A, it reduces labor. Um, the annotation of these layers is quite tedious and relies on um, a lot of work from people who have expert knowledge of the tissue. Um, and then B, it also limits us to what we already know about the tissue. Using unsupervised clustering allows us to explore the gene expression and uh, discover novel biology and different patterns of gene expression within that um, within that tissue. Um, so in this work, we had tested SPA GCN and graph-based clustering as well as base space. We found that base space was the best method to reiterate those his, uh, known histological layers. Um, so that is a spatially aware Bayesian, Bayesian cluster, clustering um, that is uh, that we applied to our Visium data. Um, and since we did this work, um, some more methods have been developed as this is a rapidly evolving field. So these methods um, include precast, graph ST, recept, and starfish, and we hope to explore those methods in future spatial work. Um, in the Visium data using base space, we examined the clustering of the spots at many different resolutions, where K here is the number of clusters that we asked base space to produce. So first we took a look at K Two, and we found that that accurate, accurately separated white versus gray matter in the tissue. Next, we looked at we found that K equal nine equal best iterated the histological layers in the tissue, and K of sixteen was a data driven optimal K based on the fast H plus statistic. So basically, we studied this tissue um, with increasing clusters and more complexity. Um, to validate the to validate those spatial domains and also add anatomical cluster, we performed spatial registration. So spatial registration is a process that relates um, the ex gene expression that relates the spatial domains back to the previously known um, gene expression in in the spatial data. So here we're relating our new base space clusters back to the manual layer annotation. Um, by correlating the T statistics of um, enrichment tests for different marker for a set of marker genes. Um, so the correlation values uh, are related between each uh, pairwise between the manual layers and the spatial domains. And then this data is related in a little heat map. Here that the purple is a negative correlation and green and dark green is a strong positive correlation. Um, so you can see that there's about one green box per pair. Um, and we have this little diagonal. And then um, we also have a second process that annotates um, 
each domain with its most strongly, uh, with strongly associated histological layer layers, um, and that's those X's. So we can see that we can kind of line up those new spatial domains back to the manual layers. Um, we also have it, the, in a, I guess like the, the nomenclature that we use to describe our spatial domains is SPK, where K is the number of domains um, for that resolution, and then D is the domain number, and then the tilde L, which is the strongly associated layer with that spatial domain. So here is spatial, you know, from a seven, seven clusters, domain one, and this highly relates to layer one. Um, so our spatial registration of our um, spatial domains, what they revealed are that for FK of nine, we split layer one into two different spatial domains, and then we could reiterate um, layers two through six, and then white matter was also split into two separate domains. K of 16 continues to like find sublayers of the histological domains, and then we also tested a K of 28, and we found that that had kind of a breakdown of our laminar structure and maybe introduced too much noise into the, um, the clustering. Um, at all these different resolutions, we are able to find uh, novel spatial domains in the DLPFC. So one example I want to point out is that the K of 9 resolution, that split of layer 1, revealed a vascular spatial domain. So that's this very um, thin line of black points. And we found that this domain was enriched for vascular genes such as CLDN5. So this kind of like refines what layer 1 and pulls out that vascular tissue. Um, so all these differentially expressed genes can be explored in our web resources, um, and we have uh, different tests across the spatial domains, including ANOVA and um, pairwise test. Um, so that data can be explored uh, through different lenses. Um, okay, so next I'll move on to talking about our identification of cell type populations in our single nucleus RNA-seq data. Um, so once again, we're working with single nucleus, not single cell, as we are limited to working with our frozen brain tissue. Um, we had 19 samples from 10 donors and 56,000 high quality nuclei. From there, we pulled out an initial 29 clusters across seven broad cell types, including astrocytes, microglia, endothelial and mural cells, oligodendrocytes, OPCs, excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So. We initially annotated our 29 clusters using um, a known set of marker genes um, and determined this breakdown of the data. Next, we know that the excitatory neurons in the DLPFC are arranged by layer. So we wanted to apply spatial registration to those manual layers and pull out the different populations um, uh, with their layer organization. So again, this is a heat map with the spatial registration where purple is negative correlation and green is that positive correlation. And for our excitatory subtypes, we found that they often had um, positive correlations with one or one to three um, of our uh, uh, laminar layers. And uh, we were able to uh, uh, annotate those cell type populations um, to those layers. Um, our inhibitory layers uh, had less uh, like not super strong um, correlations with any, uh, with not many layers. And um, for our glial cells, we found that they're mostly associated with white matter in layer one, which is expected. Um, so we have a resolution of 13 layer level cell types relating to the, again, laminar structure of the, of the domain. Um, from there, we were able to uh, pull out a set of differentially expressed genes um, and marker genes for these um, uh, cell type populations. Um, and then expanding um, with the thought of like our new uh, spatial domains is we're also able to perform spatial registration on our expanded K of nine and K of 16 um, spatial domains. And from there, uh, it kind of fine tunes the regist spatial registration of some of these cell types. So this might help us further refine that data set. And then for the third part, I'm going to be discussing the paired spatial and single nucleus RNA-seq data um, to study uh, Paired spatial and RNA-seq data. Um, so the first paired analysis that we did was spot deconvolution to predict cell type compositions of individual visium spots. Um, so uh, this is a diagram taken from the cell to location paper. Um, and basically uh, what deconvolution does is it uses the single nucleus RNA-seq data to um, explore the cell type breakdown of each individual visium spot by regressing out a cell type composition based on expression from our cell types within our single nucleus RNA-seq data. So again, predicting what cell types exist in each individual visium spot. 
So we know that there is like three to four data, typically three to four cells exist on top, like fit on each of these visium spots. So we use cell to location to predict the cell type composition of each spot. Um, so we have a breakdown of one of these overall tissue sections. Um, here you can, where each of these points is one of these little pie charts. We can see in this bottom section of the white matter that is enriched for um, oligos, our, you know, our glial cells, and then the gray matter is um, more blue, so it has more of these excitatory neurons here. And then, then we have a proportion of counts over all of our, our proportion of cell types over all 30 samples for our different nine different laminar uh, spatial domains. Um, using conversation of cell deconvolution, uh, the spatial data and the single nucleus data, we're able to also spatially map disease ligand receptor interactions. Um, so we first identified uh, ligand receptor pairs that we we're interested in uh, through the single nucleus RNA seq data in the schizophrenia risk um, ligand. Uh, schizophrenia risk ligand receptor analysis through literature. Um, we found a pair that we're interested in here. I'm discussing EFNA5 and EPHA5. Um, so we were able to perform a cell-cell communication analysis with, this, with the deconvolution data. Um, and we're also able to spatially uh, uh, analyze the spatial colocalization of that EFNA5 and EPHA5. And we found that that was enriched for in spatial uh, domains, SP9 domain seven, um, uh, which is associated with layer six. That's illustrated here, um, that's highlighted here. Um, and then this is a little imagination of uh, a breakdown of what we might imagine that these two genes uh, co-localization, co-localizing between these two cell types. Um, so our spatial data set also could bring uh, spatial information to clinical gene data sets, for instance, um, this is a differential expression study of autism spectrum disorder um, at the single cell level um, from Belvashev et al. Um, and what we did on the right here first was we performed spatial registration on their cell type pop on their cell type populations from their control individuals. So kind of establishing a baseline of where we think these cell types are associated with in our refined spatial domains. Um, and then on the right, we have a gene set enrichment analysis of their differentially expressed genes between um, control and autism spectrum um, in, each, in each cell type. So this helps us, uh, this provides like spatial context to those differentially expressed genes. What we find is sometimes that these patterns match with the spatial registration of the cell types, for instance, for their layer two, three excitatory neurons. Um, some of their gene sets are enriched for layer two, three, which is where they are predicted uh, in our spatial domains that are enriched, that are associated with layers two and three. And then they also have um, enrichment in the spatial domain seven, which is uh, associated with six here. Um, so that kind of like provides like more insight and like kind of an interesting um, angle to study these gene expressions. Um, so hopefully that can help glean more insight into um, some of these differential expression analysis. So in summary, we have a large paired single cell, um, single cell and spatial gene expression reference data set in the human DLPFC. Um, we use unsupervised clustering, which enable identification of novel spatial domains in the tissue. Um, and we have spatially resolved cell type populations in the single nucleus RNA-seq at those layer uh, with, um, with the spatial uh, layers in mind. Um, and we found that uh, we believe that this data set has great utility for informing spatially informed study of disease. Um, so this uh, study produced a huge amount of very interesting data, and we are excited to share that th through a number of interactive web resources. So that those are available at research.labd.org slash um, a spatial DLPFC. Um, so we have a shiny app for uh, we have a shiny app for um, studying the spatial domains and differential expression analysis, and also the spatial gene expression. And then we also have an IC app for uh, investigating further into the single nucleus RNA seq data. Um, so I actually have a little demo. Um, uh, 
Um, so yeah, a quick demo of this website um, where you can explore our 30 different Visium samples and explore um, genes of interest. Um, here I'll ex uh, we can check out the expression of MVP. Again, that's a marker for um, white matter and then versus maybe PCP4. Um, so if you or your group have a gene of interest that you'd like to, you know, a favorite gene that you'd like to check out over our, um, how that looks over our spatial data, it's very easily accessible. We also have the SAMWE browser, which is some new tech that we've been using um, to explore high resolution images very quickly. Um, so this also has true scale Visium spots and full resolution histological images and is great for exploring details of the tissue and um, we're expanding the tech, the, the capabilities of this um, site um, as we speak. So this work is now in preprint. Um, so uh, you know, it'd be great. Check it out if you're interested in um, spatial DL POC. Um, and with that, um, well done. And I'd like to thank the huge number of collaborators on this work from both the, Lib the Libra Institute of Brain Development, Johns Hopkins, and the University of College London. Um, so thanks. And if you have, if you have to take any questions, and if you're interested in this work, um, definitely reach out and get in touch. I'm on Twitter. Um, so thank you.